Hi. Um, when I was asked about uh, participating in this, I was given two options of either having a moderated uh, conversation or giving a prepared speech. And as usual, I chose a third option, which was just to come here and see what happens. And uh, so that sort of has been the driving force behind my work. Um, I never anticipated making documentaries. Um, I had seen a film when I was a, in my late teens called the, the, um, Trisha's Wedding, which was made by a San Francisco theater troupe called The Coquettes, and it was a parody of Richard Nixon's daughter Trisha's Wedding in the White House. And the cast was all of these like hippies and drag queens um, playing White House characters and political characters of the film. And at one point in the film, one of the characters is playing Eartha Kid and puts LSD in the punch at the White House, and it turns into a big crazy scene. And Trisha's Wedding really altered my perceptions of, of how one could be political in the world. There was nothing overtly political in the film, but it was so fundamentally challenging to everything that anyone considered conventional. And it was so fun at the same time. I thought, well, this is a really great combination, is to use humor or to use kind of indirect ways of altering people's perceptions of what normal is or what correct behavior is um, or what one should aspire to in the world. And many years later, 20-some 20, 20 years later, I was sitting in a cafe and ran into a, a guy who had actually played Lady Bird Johnson in Trisha's Wedding. And we said, God, somebody should make a film about the Coquettes. And that was how I wound up making my first documentary. It was, um, it was mostly motivated by the fact that it was a story that needed to be told. And I knew that probably if I didn't tell it, no one else would. And that probably if someone did, they wouldn't do it with as much love and affection as I would. So that's sort of how I wound up making that movie. It took about four years. I worked with a, um, a co-director on that named Bill Weber, who's still my filmmaking partner. And um, in a way, it turned out to be a love letter to San Francisco. It's, San Francisco was a city that I always sort of dreamed of moving to when I was 11, 12 years old and was reading about hippies and about the Haight-Ashbury. And in moving to San Francisco in the 70s, I really found this really remarkable city of dreamers and people who, who moved there to get away from convention and from the traps of whatever their family and normal life uh, was, were keeping them in and who moved to San Francisco to experiment and to explore other ways of living. Um, when I finished The Coquettes, uh, which didn't do great at the box office, but it's become pretty, uh, pretty much of a cult uh, classic, um, people kept saying, well, what's your next project? What's your next project? And my feeling was, I can't imagine another movie that would speak to who I am on as many different levels. The movie was about hippies and drag queens and politics and San Francisco and LSD and all the things that I care about. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, it's a crazy thing to make a documentary. It's, it's uh, exhausting, it's hard to raise money, it's stressful. And I thought, well, I can't imagine any other subject matter that would compel me um, with that would speak to that many aspects of who I am. Because not just the specifics of that subject matter, but the larger themes of, of living life adventurously and art for art's sake and, um, and prioritizing community over uh, career or making money. Um, it was a very countercultural film and, and a, a very celebratory of, um, of kind of countercultural values. And, you know, People kept saying, well, you have to make another movie, you have to make another movie. And I just, you know, I never plan. I never really uh, know what I'm going to do next. And so I moved to Portland. I did a little bit of teaching, a little bit of writing. Um, and I had a boyfriend for a year and a half who was significantly younger than me. And he heard me talk a lot about my years living in San Francisco. I moved there in 1976 which was really just the explosive moment of gay liberation in San Francisco. It was very exciting. It was a wonderful time when the gay community was really first defining itself in a way really that was historically unprecedented in San Francisco, um, which was really the, the mecca of gay liberation uh, in the early years, and in many ways still is. So I moved there in 76 and basically lived there pretty much until now, with the exception of the time I've been in Portland. And uh, my boyfriend David had heard me speak so much of various aspects of my life there, but particularly about my experiences during the AIDS epidemic. Um, uh, the losses that I'd experienced, the politics of those years, um, how it had impacted me. And he was also a filmmaker, and he said, well, why don't you make a film about this? 
And it was sort of like that same moment of speaking to the Lady Bird Johnson guy of um, this moment of revelation of like, oh, well, this is really what I'm supposed to do next. Um, and so that was my moment of winging it that led to the making of, um, of We Were Here. Uh, in a sense, We Were Here and the Cockettes are both love letters to San Francisco. Uh, my Part of what happened for me when David suggested that I make the movie was a similar realization that probably no one else would make the movie if I didn't. And I felt like that if someone did, I also wanted it to be made by someone who had actually lived through the experience. I didn't want the story of AIDS in San Francisco to be told by a journalist, um, by someone who was coming from the outside and trying to make sense of the story. It was, it was so deeply a part of my personal experience and the personal experience of everyone I know that I knew in San Francisco in those years. Um, so very, very quickly, um, after I got over the initial feeling of like, oh my God, that's the last thing in the world that I would want to do is to revisit that incredibly painful past. I got very excited very quickly and the movie started to, uh, to come together. Uh, I went down to San Francisco. I'd been living in Portland, as I said, and uh, found my first initial funding to get started. It's an enormous, enormous subject matter. I mean, the AIDS epidemic itself is enormous reducing it down to San Francisco, it's still an enormous subject. And not only is it enormous in terms of history, in terms of the complexity of the politics, in terms of the, um, I mean, it's just, it's a huge, long history from the beginning of the AIDS epidemic up until now. But it's also a story that has enormous, enormous emotional resonance for particularly the people who lived through it uh, and particularly for people who are still living with HIV, but also just anyone in San Francisco who lived through that era. So it was a very kind of scary project to, um, to take on. I think I started it with two kind of primary fears, one of which was that um, I would show it in a movie theater and people would afterwards, they would go, you got it wrong or you didn't tell the part of the story that mattered most to me uh, or, or you got the politics wrong. And, the idea of, of putting my heart and soul into a movie and then having to deal with, uh, with people saying that it wasn't the movie that they wanted to see was something that I worried about from the very beginning. And at the same time, I had a, a kind of an opposite fear was that if I did a good job with it, uh, it had the potential of unleashing kind of like a nuclear reaction of unleashed grief in those of us who did live through that period. Um, when the uh, AIDS cocktail, which is the, the drug regimen that started to keep people from dying in the mid-90s, when that started to work and the death toll from the epidemic started to diminish, I think for many of us, uh, we were so relieved to have some sort of avenue back to a kind of normalcy after 15 years of just kind of relentless uh, death and suffering in our community, that as, as the death tolls got lower and lower and lower and the disease has become more and more manageable, people sort of started to try to move back to more normal lives. And the whole kind of subject matter of what happened, particularly in the early years of AIDS, has kind of disappeared. Um, the gay liberation, modern gay liberation movement started with uh, the Stonewall riots in New York in 1969. And the AIDS epidemic started only 12 years after that. I mean, we were an incredibly new community um, that was defining our identity, exploring how we wanted to relate to the world and to each other. And, and how to overcome the homophobia that was so incredibly endemic all throughout society. Um, and then, you know, bang, comes this, this completely terrifying and horrible disease that turns out to be sexually transmitted and becomes really the dominant piece of gay and lesbian history um, in the post-Stonewall era. Um, so, I got started working on the movie and I had one friend who I'd known from doing HIV prevention work in San Francisco, and he was my first kind of experiment on how I was going to tell, uh, tell the story. I, I knew that he had a deep uh, history with the epidemic and a deep passion for the story being told. And um, so he and I sat down to just kind of experiment with an interview. And in the middle of the night, I mean, getting back to the winging it part, in the middle of the night before I interviewed him, I woke up and I thought, oh my God, I have no notes. I've done no research. Um, 
and I'm doing the first interview of my movie tomorrow. When we made the coquettes, we had pages of uh, outlines and, and background material to approach the interviews. And very quickly, I realized, you know, this is my story that we're telling here. This is something that I lived through. It's the story that I'm going to tell from an insider's perspective. And that's the research that I need for this. And um, it, was a, it was a wonderful moment of revelation for me. So when I started to interview Ed, um, at that point, I didn't know how I was going to handle the balance of facts, and, you know, broad facts and personal stories, how many people I would have in the film, the balance of uh, interview and archival material. And I thought, well, maybe I'll have to interview, um, you know, 25 or 30 people and then see how to put this movie together. And about two minutes into the interview with Ed, I realized, well, there's not going to be more than seven people in the movie. And what's going to make this story work is the depth and the emotional resonance of people's personal histories rather than breadth of subject matter and breadth of facts. And that was sort of the beginning. And it was a, it was, uh, the, the movie came together very, very quickly. Um, the, one of the things that always comes up in Q and A's, there's five people in the film. All of them are people who lived in San Francisco prior to the epidemic beginning because I wanted to follow their journeys as people who came to San Francisco with a dream like I did, who came there because of what the city represented, because of its magic and its politics. And so I wanted to be able to follow people who came to San Francisco with that dream and see how their lives changed um, with the coming of the epidemic and how those changes reflected a larger kind of historical uh, picture of the time. And one of the questions that comes up most frequently in question and answer is, how did you pick the five people that are in the film? And it gets back to this same sort of process of winging it in a certain way. All of them are people who I sort of knew a little bit, and I ran into them somewhere. I ran into one of the people at a demonstration, and in the course of conversation with him, I thought, hmm, you know, he has a really interesting past. Maybe he would be interested in being in the film. And that's basically what happened with all of the people in the film. They got there because of a combination of chance, which is me running into them, and intuition, which was me having a sense of their personality, of their history, of the vibe, uh, the emotional comfort level between us, and of their willingness to say yes when I asked, that led to them being in the movie. And it's sort of an unconventional way to work, and yet it's the only way that I know how to work. Um, uh, I've also been asked at Q&As about the research that I did on the film, and like I said, I didn't do any. Um, the movie is very much driven by, to some degree, the confidence that I learned as a filmmaker from making the coquettes, from the confidence I have in my working relationship with my filmmaking partner, and also in the faith that I have in my intuition, um, and knowing that I am choosing to make a movie because I have this very, very strong intuitive sense of the importance of the story. And um, so yeah, it's kind of, it's an unusual process, and I think that the film is unusual in that it is so based in a kind of an intuitive uh, process. I was talking with um, someone earlier, I, I forgot your name, Zach. with Zach, who's going to be speaking to you later, who made a wonderful film. And he was talking about the amount of footage that they had, uh, in the, uh, which he will tell you about in, in making the interrupters, and that they started with a four or five, six hour cut. And I was telling him that in, in editing this film, we almost started with our first cut being just very little longer than the end, um, uh, end product of, the, of what the final film is. And so I, th I think that it reflected, again, a very strong intuitive sense of the story that we wanted to tell and a very clear focus in, uh, in the editing room that was a shared kind of intuitive sense between me and my filmmaking partner. Um, I have to pause and say, am I out of time here? Because the clock says zero and okay. Um, anyway, I'm sort of yammering on here, but I just sort of wanted to talk a little bit about my process and about the film. Um, it, the film is in release theatrically. We still don't know if we have a Chicago date yet. Uh, we're actually hoping to get it here. So if the programmers are here, um, but it was at Sundance. It's actually the top reviewed film on Metacritic for the entire year, um, and uh, it's also 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's a, it's it's doing really wonderfully. It's, playing lots of film festivals, and I hope you do get a chance to see it in Chicago. It's playing at the Gay and Lesbian Film Festival here in, um, in November. It's the centerpiece documentary of the Chicago Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. So 
if it's time for me to wrap it up, I will wrap it up. And thank you all for listening and uh, hope you get to see the film.